Hi, I'm Jackson Crawford. I'm a specialist in the Old Norse language and in Norse mythology. I have a PhD in Scandinavian languages and philology from the University of Wisconsin, and I've been a faculty member teaching in these subjects at the University of California, Los Angeles, University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Colorado. I'm also a translator of Norse myths, and I have been a consultant on various media projects, including Disney's Frozen and Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I'm here today to take a look at some clips from the video game God of War, commenting on places where it might digress from or interpret Norse mythology in interesting ways. All right, so there's a bunch of runes here and I'm gonna pause. The runes in the game are all Elder Futhark which is the runic alphabet that was actually used many centuries before the Old Norse or Viking period. So in fact, the letters are out of place or out of time. It's hard to make an analogy with English, but it's actually more jarring than if you wrote like 2021 text speak in some kind of medieval black letter. It's actually extremely mismatched to the, to the language. So the language that's written in this is Old Norse, although the grammar is not fully correct. And there's not really rules for writing Old Norse in these older runes because these runes went out of use before the Old Norse language existed as such, right? These were used for a much earlier stage of the language. But it's, it's actually fairly hard to read because again, the alphabet's not designed for the language that's written in it. But here we do see something like, and I can't see all the letters very clearly, but the last two words are intended to be Mithgar's Vaga, so the cradle of Mithgar, they're the world, the realm of human beings. And he does say the translation something like that here. Awaken again the cradle of the world. What? Throw our weapons into the water? It's possible that the sacrifice your weapons thing goes back to archaeological discoveries from Scandinavia where, and, and often from earlier than the Viking Age. It appears that the weapons of perhaps defeated armies were sacrificed en masse, sometimes in watery locations. <laughs> Sounds kind of like a nerdy kid is telling you what insect he just collected outside. It does seem appropriately huge, given that it's supposed to encircle the earth. And I see that the axe is supposed to be Aether imbued. Aether is Old Norse for poison, which uh, the serpent does spit at its opponents. It speaks? Yeah! Mom said he's friendly! What does it say? I don't know! I can't tell if it's supposed to be saying words here. And I guess the kid agrees. I don't believe there is any passage in the Eddas where the serpent speaks. I think that they do a really good job of suggesting that it is just that towering, just that you know inestimable in size. I can't tell that it's supposed to be saying anything. Maybe it's not really supposed to be saying anything for us to understand. The very voice that's used is sort of fast and, and t right, it, it seems outside the range of of speech that a human could do. So I guess that also kind of suggests its size as well. There's no particularly detailed description of its appearance anywhere either, other than that it's a huge serpent. In fact, its name Jormungandr means literally just huge monster, basically. I like that it's kind of snake-like here. I think that we may sometimes be a little too tempted to depict Norse dragons as 20th century night movie dragons. But in fact, the word they always use in Old Norse is worm or, worm or serpent. So the fact that it looks like a, you know, like a big snake actually works pretty well for me. So we don't really have a physical description of Freya except that she's supposed to be a beautiful woman. In fact, in the sagas and, and the Eddas, our sources of myth, the poetic and prose Edda, were surprised in a saga to get a, a few lines about a hero's appearance. Mostly it seems kind of expected to imagine what someone looks like. One thing I will point out about appearance in general in these clips from the games is there's a lot of tattoos. That has become a big part of how people imagine Viking and Norse culture today, but in fact, we really don't have any solid evidence for tattooing in the Norse world. There's not even an Old Norse word for tattoo. Real single source for the notion that the Norse were tattooed is the Arabic writer Ibn Fadlan, who in 922 or 923 encountered some Rus, some Eastern Swedish Vikings in uh, what is today Kazan, Russia, and he says they were tattooed. And that is the one source that we have for the notion that Vikings were tattooed. They never talk about tattoos. Again, they have no word for tattoo. I think there's way too many tattoos in our modern depictions of the Norse. And I, and I guess it's mostly derived from Ibn Fadlan and maybe from modern fantasy ideas. This temple has been asleep underwater for almost 150 winters. 
It needs only the light of the Bifrost to reawaken. Now here we get a lot of talk about what she calls the Bifrost. I think a lot of the ideas about this concept in modern popular culture, including this game, are probably traceable to the fact that people see the word frost in this name, but that's not actually what the name is. The name is Biv Rost. So the F and the R are actually part of different roots in the name. It's the shimmering mile, which is the rainbow. So she hands him this little thing and says, this is a Bifrost to create travel between realms. It can capture, hold, and transfer the light of all time. But the, the Bivros is just, it's the rainbow up in the sky. So I'm confused about what this little thing is supposed to be. Crossing between realms is not this big mechanistic deal in the myths. Often traveling between realms seems to be a fairly simple process of just traveling for a long time, sometimes in unconventional ways. Thor, for example, rides back and forth between Osgar, the realm of the gods, and Jotunheimar, the realm of their enemies, just on his wagon. It's, it's not as mechanistic, magical seeming in the myths. And Yggdrasil, the tree, has a pretty exaggerated importance in a lot of pop culture depictions. It doesn't actually appear in very many myths. It is an enormous tree that is never called in Old Norse something like World Tree or Tree of Life, as it often is today in popular depictions. And it has roots in three different realms. There's one in Ulskar there with the gods, one in Milton Hamar with their enemies, and one in Hell with the dead. But it does not seem to actually be a means of transport between them. It's just that its roots are, are located in those places. I do like that they use the word realm rather than world, because world I think gives the 21st century mind an impression of planet, which of course is not what they have. Realm is much vaguer and that's nice because in Old Norse it's fairly vague too. You can't exactly draw a map realms are in relation to each other. But the word, the word nine, the number nine, is very important to the Norse. They talk about there being nine realms, but it's not actually very clear what the nine are. There's only four in which any of the action of our myths take place. Mythgarther, the middle enclosure within which humans live. Bosgarther, vaguely above us, within which the gods live. Jotunheimar, which is beyond those enclosures, which is where God's enemies live, the so-called giants, and then Hell, the realm of the dead, which seems vaguely below us. It's neat that they try to incorporate these other realms. Of course, they're tabula rasa. We know nothing about a place like Alfheimer. You know, it also gives them a lot of creative freedom. You can't really contradict what the myths say about Alfheimer because the myths say nothing about it. Now again, nothing actually happens in the myths in Ulfhammer, so this is a blank slate for them to write upon. The association of the elves with light is legitimate. Snorri and the Prose Edda, one of our two major sources for Norse myth, tells us that the elves are, are, are like brighter than a sun ray, so they are associated with light somehow, although it's very vague what exactly elves are. Something's wrong. See that column of light on the horizon? It's housed in the heart of a ring temple. We'll find what we need there. She mentions a ring temple. I think that may be something different in the game than it is in, in real life. Norse temples to the old gods, although we know fairly little about them, were supposed to contain a ring upon which a uh, an oath was supposed to be sworn. If you swore an oath on the ring in the temple, that was a, a very firm oath. And here we have a pretty good example of their use of runes. Again, this is Elder Futhark. It's a much earlier alphabet than was actually used to write Old Norse, so they're having to kind of jam Old Norse into this alphabet that doesn't fit it. And now I see some text on the side about dark elves. We hear about elves, which are supposed to be bright, and dark elves, which are supposed to be, well, dark, whatever exactly that means. But elves are so vaguely described that we really don't know what they are. There's also, interestingly, actually supposed to be a separate realm where the dark elves live called Svartalvahamer, home of the dark elves. So maybe this is envisioning a kind of inter-realm conflict between the elves and the dark elves. If these are dark elves with the kind of wasp wings, I'll point out that there's no reason to think that elves have wings anywhere. There's also no reason to think anything about elves because it's, again, an extremely vague term in Old Norse myth. Your father won't let me go, Baldur, and he won't let you kill me. New location opened, Loch Lomond. I don't know why Mimir has a Scottish accent. I could make a really roundabout explanation, possibly. Mimir is only a head in our actual Norse sources, which he becomes later in this clip. And the notion of the head and the well is also a motif shared with Celtic folklore, but that may be stretching it a bit much. A Mimir, also called just Mim, is a curious figure. He appears only as a head in our actual myths. And we find him in two places. We hear that Odin keeps his head as something to consult with because Mimir is so wise that he uh, knows more than anyone else. 
We also hear that Odin went to Mimir's well. If anyone drinks from the well, it will make him wise. So Odin wants to drink from Mimir's well, but Mimir says he has to pop out an eye and leave it in the well as his price. So that's why Odin is one-eyed. Now here we see Mimir depicted as one-eyed, but that is not part of the original myth. It's Odin himself who's one-eyed. He's also got a lot of tattoos on his head. Again, the tattoos are really a, a modern projection onto the Vikings rather than something we have evidence for in the medieval period. The highest peak in all the realms is not here in Midgard. It's in Jotunheim, realm of the giants. No! That could not be what she meant. Now they're frustrated about the highest peak in all the realms being in Jotunheimar. The Eddas don't mention any particular highest peak, but it is true that the, uh, the Jotnar, the so-called giants, the anti-gods, are associated with mountains. It is neat and would make sense if the highest point was, was with them. So the realm of the dead is called Hel. It's never actually called Helheimr. Of course, there are some realms that have that Heim. Heimr means home. So there's Jotunheimr, which means homes of the so-called giants. There's Aldheimr, so home of the elves. So by analogy, Helheimr would be like Hel home. But in fact, in the Eddas, it's just called Hel. Quite a bit of action occurs in Hel because you can go there before you die. There are paths to Hel. And in fact, Odin himself goes to Hel on at least one occasion before he dies. But it seems to be more of a vaguely underground shadow of the world of the living. There is a bridge that you cross to get into hell, and it does have a guardian. However, the guardian is a woman, a, a so-called giant. Her name is Mothguther, and she actually often does have a dialogue with people who have either died and are crossing the bridge because they're going on to their afterlife in hell, or people who are visiting hell. But she's not a, a combative character, right? She's not fighting you with this big clock tower that she's swinging at you like this guy. But there is a guardian of hell, but but it, but it is that, that female figure. There's a large bird of prey that sits on top of Yggdrasil, alternately called Vetherfolnir, whether Worsener or Hrasvelger, raw meat swallower. And he beats his wings to create the winds. I've never seen him located in hell because he's on top of the tree, Yggdrasil, which is not in hell. One of its roots is down in hell. He is said at one juncture to be uh, Yultun i Arnarham, so that would mean a giant and an eagle shape, so he could be among the so-called giants of the Yultnar. He has a lot of tattoos. Right, so the one thing that Baldur was vulnerable to after his mother Frigg made everything swear not to harm him was mistletoe because she said that the plant mistletoe was too young to swear an oath. This is actually kind of a motif in Norse mythology and sagas where something that uh, was too young, someone or something too young to swear an oath is the one that ends up breaking the oath. He makes a big deal out of how he can feel this. Uh, the, the original myths and the Eddas don't ever say anything about him not being able to feel anything, only that nothing can, can harm him. So that's kind of a elaboration on the original. Yeah, all this drama between Baldur and his mother is pretty foreign to the original sources. The mother of Baldur and the Eddas is Frigg, Odin's wife. There are some signs that Frigg and Freya might have at one time been regarded as one figure, so the conflation of the two is not, I would say there's anything wrong with it in a presentation like this. You know, this whole dialogue about some complicated motivations here, I have no idea where that's coming from in terms of the original mythology. In the original, it's just that everybody loves Baldur so much that they don't want him to die. He is supposed to be incredibly beautiful, so all the gods and goddesses just love him, and uh, Frigg just wants to make sure that someone so beloved isn't going to die. That's it's a, it's a much simpler motivation. And of course, Baldur is killed when Loki gives some mistletoe to the blind god Holder to throw at Baldur, because Holder doesn't know what he's throwing. The cycle ends here. Must be better than this. Family is a major theme, of course. You know, it's a very family-based society, very family-based morality. And one of the great tragedies throughout Norse mythology is that it is family members who end up being in conflict. So many of the Norse sagas, the greatest conflicts are between family members who maybe have to cross one another because one swore an ill-advised oath that later put him into conflict with another family member. And, you know, will he break his oath or will he have to, you know, harm a family member? As different as some of the particular relationships are from what's in the Eddas, the emphasis on conflict between members of one family is thematically very similar to the original, and I appreciate that. It's also just a visually impressive game. It's got a very absorbing atmosphere to it, and the art often does uh, harken back and remind me of, of actual Viking Age art. 
Uh, there are lots of runes in this scene. So you've got the language of today and the alphabet of 2,000 years ago, but it's supposed to be the language of 1,000 years ago. It's that, That's a fairly anachronistic part of this. The giants called me... Loki? Spoiler alert. If this kid is Loki, in the Eddas, his father is a so-called giant named Forbauti, and his mother is a goddess, Lavoi. Loki is often called Loki Lavoi or son, Loki son of Lavoi, because the names alliterate in Norse poetry makes use of alliteration. All of the gods have several names. Loki is the usual name under which Loki is known. He does have others, such as Lothar. It's a prominent other name of Loki. No drama, no explanation, no history ever given behind him being named. We don't ever get a view into Loki, Loki's childhood. His name is actually probably related to uh, the English word lock. So he may well be actually the locked one. This may refer to the fact that he is locked up under the earth with a snake's venom dripping on his face after he kills Baldur. It may also refer to the way that his lips are locked up but being sewn together by some dwarves after he betrays them. But at any rate, that appears to be the meaning of his name. He's the, the locked one. What has made all of this become so world-conqueringly popular in the last 20 years? I kind of think it might have started with the Lord of the Rings movies because Tolkien was so inspired by Norse mythology and I think people looking for more of something like Tolkien might have started turning to, to Norse mythology around that time. As an instructor of these subjects, it's sometimes difficult because people have been so exposed to these popular culture treatments that they come in with all of these assumptions formed by them. So an example is the Marvel Universe depicting Thor and Loki as, as brothers. That gets surprisingly ingrained in people and it distorts how they read the original medieval sources. So that's that's that has a distorting effect. But it's been, it, it's it's amazing to me, just the reach of this stuff now. I mean, clearly, Norse myth strikes a chord with millions of people now. And, and, and I do think that it probably has something to do with the kind of mysterious, open-ended nature of, of the mythic world, right? That may be because our sources are kind of incomplete. So you can take them as kind of blank slates. You can paint over the scaffold with, with all the details you want, like, like we saw in the God of War with the way they did Alfheimer, for example. When this game first came out and someone sent me a clip of it, I wrote back and said, you sent me the wrong thing because you sent me a clip of a movie, right? I didn't realize video games look like movies now. So I am way out of this loop. <laughs> For more Expert Reacts or God of War, you're already in the right place with IGN. 